Booster 18 exploded during testing just days ago. While crews were still cutting apart the wreckage at Massey's, SpaceX quietly revealed something unprecedented inside Star Factory. Eight Starship upper stages are now under construction simultaneously. Ships 40 through 48, all Block 3 versions. We've never seen this production scale before. But here's what's shocking. Booster 19 stacked three major barrel sections in just two days. Booster 18 took 10 days for the same work. Why this sudden acceleration right after a catastrophic failure? What's driving SpaceX to build faster than ever when they just lost their first V3 booster? Let me show you exactly what happened in the 72 hours after Booster 18 ruptured. While that twisted metal was still smoking at Massey's test stand, SpaceX rolled out the AP-4 barrel section for Booster 19 on Sunday the 30th. This single piece contains four rings of the liquid oxygen tank. Two days later, the AT-5 section appeared. For context, these same sections took 10 days between movements on Booster 18. SpaceX just cut their timeline by 80%. What changed in their production process that suddenly made this possible? The answer might be hiding in plain sight. Thursday brought something unusual. A mysterious tube rolled out from behind the construction fence. Our team identified it as the liquid methane header tank the critical component that feeds fuel to engines during landing without risking propellant slosh or air pockets. But here's the strange part. They moved this tank before the transfer tube even appeared. Standard procedure is transfer tube first, then header tank. Saturday morning revealed why. The transfer tube finally emerged at noon, following its own path to Mega Bay 2. SpaceX wasn't following their normal sequence. They were running parallel operations, building multiple sections simultaneously instead of sequentially. Right now, Booster 19 needs just five components to reach full stack. The internal landing tank, the aft barrel, the forward barrel, and two liquid methane barrel sections. SpaceX calculated they need to stack one major section every 3.5 days to meet their year-end target. They're beating that pace. But production isn't the only area where SpaceX accelerated. Down in McGregor, Texas, something significant happened on Monday. Raptor 3 serial number 76 left the test facility, joining the growing inventory of flight-ready engines. Here's the math that matters. SpaceX now has more than 39 Raptor 3 engines, validated and ready. 33 sea-level engines for the booster, three more for the ship, and three vacuum-optimized variants. And since Booster 18 wasn't equipped with any engines when it failed, every single Raptor 3 they've built is still available. They haven't lost a single flight engine to the failure. Remember that 388-second Raptor burn test from November 25th? SpaceX just released the full 6-minute, 42-second video showing the entire test. This wasn't just an endurance run. This was a complete Starship 5-3 ascent burn simulation, validating how the three inner engines perform during the initial climb to space. SpaceX confirmed they'll run multiple versions of this test to cover every condition those engines will face. To support more testing, they're expanding infrastructure at an aggressive pace. Thursday brought installation of a new vertical tank at the Raptor South site. Friday saw two brand new vaporizers arrive at Raptor North. These systems convert cryogenic liquids into gases for multiple processes across the facility. Why install this equipment now unless they're planning to dramatically increase their testing tempo? But the real story is what's happening inside Star Factory. This is where SpaceX revealed their hand. Eight Starship nose cones are currently in production simultaneously. Ships 40 through 48, all Block 3 variants, are at different stages of completion. 
Let me walk you through what we're seeing, because the scale is unprecedented. Ship 40 assigned to Flight 13 just completed stacking on its payload section and was freed from scaffolding. It should have rolled to Mega Bay 2 immediately. Instead, SpaceX moved it back and erected scaffolding around the nose cone again. Something came up. Possibly a thermal protection system issue or tile work that needed correction. This is the meticulous attention to detail that prevents another Ship 33 situation. Ship 41 sits in a similar state, but hasn't been welded to its payload section yet. SpaceX will roll the PS dispenser system into Mega Bay 2 first, then bring in the payload section and nose cone as a single unit. Ship 42 is receiving its thermal protection system installation right now. Without TPS tiles, Starship becomes a meteor during re-entry. The tiles are critical, but underneath them sits a pyron ablative coating, serving as last resort protection if tiles break or fall off. SpaceX tested this backup system on previous flights. The forward flaps won't be installed until tile work is complete. That's standard procedure, but it tells us Ship 42 is still weeks away from rolling out. Ship 43 represents the fourth Block 3 ship in active production. It's waiting for tile studs, the blade layer, cowl layer, tiles themselves, forward flap arrow covers, and the forward flaps. The ship is in early phases, but its presence in the production line confirms SpaceX isn't slowing down, despite the Booster 18 setback. Now Ship 44 presents a mystery. We haven't seen it inside Star Factory since August. SpaceX pulled it from the production line with no public explanation. Theories vary, but the most compelling centers on HLS, the Human Landing System variant for NASA's Artemis program. Could Ship 44 be the first HLS cabin flight article? If SpaceX is diverting a production slot for lunar mission hardware, it signals their confidence in solving the Block 3 issues quickly. They're not pausing commercial Starship development to focus on moon missions. They're running both programs in parallel. Ships 45 and 46 are progressing through nose cone assembly. Both have received their liquid oxygen and liquid methane header tanks, the components that ensure smooth propellant flow during the flip maneuver and landing burn. Ship 46 also has its composite overwrap pressure vessels installed. These COPVS are essential for starting and relighting the Raptor engines, capabilities we've seen demonstrated on multiple flights now. Ship 47 sits in a similar state to Ship 44 before its removal, waiting for ships ahead to clear the production line. And Ship 48 is in very early stages, not even a complete nose cone yet. But there's one more piece of hardware we can't ignore. The original Ship 33, not the Block 2 version that flew on Flight 7, but the first iteration destined to be a Block 1 ship before SpaceX scrapped those plans. This payload section has sat inside Star Factory for more than two years. Recent camera footage shows the tiles removed, exposing the cowl layer underneath. This hardware is finally heading for the scrapyard. Why keep it this long? We may never know, but its removal makes space for the next generation. Over at the Mega Bays, SpaceX removed the counterbalance beam jig from Mega Bay 1 after installing new work platforms in both bays. These platforms increase accessibility to different areas of the boosters during assembly and testing. In Mega Bay 2, we spotted modifications to another ship work stand. The maintenance platforms at the lifting platform were removed and replaced. Block 3 ships require new maintenance platforms for Raptor 3 installation and additional access to the aft sections. Version 3 hardware demands significant tooling changes, and we're watching that transformation happen in real time. At the launch site, Pad 1's Deluge Farm is being dismantled. The arch-shaped deluge pipes that once fed water to the flame trench are being cut and removed. These pipes used gaseous nitrogen pockets to control water flow, 
When the deluge activated, the gas expelled and water rushed to the cooled steel plate under the launch mount. SpaceX wants this system gone fast to make room for the more powerful deluge system currently used on Pad 2. The chopsticks on Pad 1 appear temporarily disabled, actuator hardware was removed, and the cable chain, which supplies power and hydraulic fluid to the chopsticks, was recently reinstalled after internal line reconfiguration. Pad 2 is where the real action is focused. Both chopstick lateral movement actuators were removed and left the launch site entirely, guaranteeing a prolonged absence. Either something went wrong or SpaceX is upgrading performance on these already lighter, faster chopsticks compared to Pad 1's original design. Both booster quick disconnects came alive this week, extending and retracting in what appears to be mating simulations. This marked the first time we've observed both QDs retracting simultaneously at high speed. SpaceX is dialing in their retraction timing for optimal launch performance. The ship Quick Disconnect Arm received plumbing installation bridging the tower and the arm itself. This will eventually allow propellant to flow from the orbital tank farm up through the tower and out to the ship connection plate. We're still waiting for the other half of this arm, the section holding the actual connection unit. Another deluge test ran this week, though it came from the flame trench rather than the mount's top deck. This could be preparation for booster static fire testing, which wouldn't require the top deck deluge. The air separation unit construction near the launch site is progressing well. SpaceX will use this facility to produce their own liquid oxygen, nitrogen, and small amounts of argon. Right now, the main tank farm supports roughly one and a half launches before requiring replenishment. The ASU will drastically reduce turnaround time and eliminate the convoy of tanker trucks rolling down Highway 4. This week brought delivery of what appears to be a centrifugal compressor from Atlas Copco. This machine compresses air to cryogenic temperatures, liquefying oxygen and separating nitrogen. The number of compressors will determine production volume. At Massey's test stand, the response to Booster 18's failure has been methodical and rapid. SpaceX continued cutting into the liquid oxygen tank throughout the week, removing Chinese and the transfer tube to clear the cryo stand as quickly as possible. They need this space for Booster 19's testing campaign, but they paused, scrapping operations for something more important. Ship 39.1's first cryogenic test. Ship 39.1 is the V3 ship aft test article, and its performance determines whether full Ship 39 moves forward. The test article was moved to the cryo station and connected with ground support equipment lines. Tank farm activity picked up immediately. Venting and vapor indicated imminent testing. Condensation formed on the tank surfaces as nitrogen flowed in for the first time. Then suddenly, detanking began. Was this an abort or planned? No obvious signs of failure appeared. The next day confirmed everything was nominal. SpaceX ran a second test that lasted an astonishing seven hours. Seven hours of continuous cryogenic testing on a new V3 test article. This duration gave SpaceX confidence that Ship 39.1 is performing as designed, which should greenlight Ship 39's own cryogenic campaign. Later that week, two stands rolled toward Massey's, the newly converted V3 booster transport stand and a normal ring stand. These would carry Booster 18's aft and forward sections back to the production site. By evening, both sections were staged at Massey's entrance. Later that night, they rolled down Highway 4 back to the production site. Booster 18's aft section now sits in the rocket garden next to Booster 12. The forward section rests near Mega Bay 1 and 2, where it will be completely cut up and disposed of. The thrust structure from the forward section might be salvaged for another booster, but that's far from guaranteed. 
Despite foggy weather, more venting built up at Massey's that night. Liquid nitrogen load began for ship 39.1 again. This test ran about five hours before detanking. More testing is likely coming for this critical test article. So here's what SpaceX accomplished in one week, while critics assumed they'd slow down. Booster 19 gained three major barrel sections. Eight ships advanced through production. Raptor, three validation continued at record pace. Infrastructure expanded at multiple facilities, and ship 39.1 passed its initial cryogenic tests. Does this look like a program in crisis? So let's address what we've witnessed here. When Booster 18 failed, the expected response would be investigation, delays, redesigns. The typical aerospace playbook. SpaceX wrote a different script. They accelerated. Eight starships in simultaneous production. Booster 19 stacking at speeds we've never documented. Ship 39.1 passing seven-hour cryogenic tests. Infrastructure expanding across McGregor, Starbase, and the launch site. This isn't reaction. This is execution of a plan that was already in motion. The question isn't whether SpaceX can recover from Booster 18. They already have. The real question is what they know about version 3 that we're only beginning to understand. Every barrel section, every Raptor test, every infrastructure upgrade points to the same conclusion. SpaceX designed this system expecting failures and built the production capacity to absorb them without slowing down. Will Booster 19 complete stacking by year-end? Based on their current pace, they're ahead of schedule. Can Flight 12 launch in Q1-2025? That depends on pad readiness and regulatory approval, but the hardware won't be the limiting factor. Here's what I want to know from you. Which ship do you think will fly Flight 13, Ship 40, or will SpaceX skip ahead? And what do you think happened to Ship 44? Drop your analysis in the comments. If this breakdown showed you something the mainstream coverage missed, hit that like button and share this with someone tracking SpaceX. Subscribe to New Space Review for coverage that goes beyond the surface level. We're building something different here, and you're part of it.